Now it's time to give our cup the right textures and make a scene out of that. My name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. Thanks a lot for coming back to this lesson here. And as promised, I've generated in a bonus lesson some textures for you in the classic workflow. So I use Substance Painter, like I've said, classic, not with UDIMS, and added these textures to our Houdini project. If you want to have the whole project, you can get it for a really small fee on Gumroad, like all the other Houdini Practice Hour projects. But I've also showed how to paint textures in the toothbrush project and the banana project. So it's no problem for you to make this by yourself. And like promised, you will get two bonus lessons here for free in the next days. One is this painting process in Substance Painter, which I did for the textures, which I use in this lesson here and one for the UDIM workflow, which is really interesting. And I used for this 3D code so that you see also another tool, how it works. But for this lesson, I now have my textures prepared and we start exactly where we left off in the last lesson. So I first add a grid now here to my scene. And maybe I save this file first into my project file so that all the guys from Gumroad get exactly what they want. I save it here as materials classic because that's the classic approach. And yeah, this grid here is now the floor. So make it floor, go to the handle tool. How big is that? First discussion, how big is my scene? So this is a really important discussion you have to do. While I was modeling, I was not thinking about sizes because it's not important at this point. So if you now want to do photorealistic rendering and VFX, it's always important to think about size of scenes. Lights behave different and everything, the simulations behave different. So at the end of a process, I normally go in and make everything in the right size. So how big is that? The first indicator which you can use is here your grid. So let's hide the other objects. Because every of these grid cells here is a meter because Houdini is a simulation program. So this is a meter. So this thing here looks really big, five meters or so. You can test this. Make a middle mouse button, click here on the null object of the cup, and then you have here the information about the bounding box. And here you see, yeah, this cup is four and a half meters. So it's a big cup. So it's good for my coffee consume, but yeah, it's a little bit too big for photorealistic rendering. How to bring everything back? You can go here at the end of the whole thing and add a transform. This is size. And what I want is I go to the uniform scale and size it now down zero point, mm, let's say seven five, no, zero seven five. Let's test this. I go back in here and indicator here again. And you now see it's 30 centimeters high. Yeah, it's still big. Mm. So make it smaller. Yeah. And so I say that's it now. Let's go out here. Real world size is okay. I saved this and now we can start placing stuff. And let's get rid of this camera. I want to do it again. Go back to the floor. This was the point where I started. Now we have a floor 10 meter by 10 meter. It's big enough for my taste. We don't need all the rows and columns, so set them to two. So we don't need polygons here lying around. And then I place myself here in a good angle to this coffee cup and the floor, something like that, maybe. Okay, I want to grab you. And then I hold down the control key and click here on the camera. So the camera is placed now where I was as a viewer. Then I go into the camera settings and here's the resolution. Houdini gets its document size for the rendering from the camera. You can override it in the render node, but it's a good habit to make it in camera. So you can type here or you can open presets and I want to have it full HD. This is full HD. Great. The focal length I want to use is 75. And then you can, with the help of your friend, the handle tool, I activate the camera, the handle tool. And this little widget here, you can place yourself. This handle tool is really cool. I like it a lot. So you can move your camera here on a plane, up, down, and left, right. Then you can dolly in and out with this here. Then you can rotate the camera by these three widgets here. So rotate to the left, rotate 
down and up. And this here is, yeah, rotating in this direction. Really easy to do all that. And I place myself now here. And yeah, that's it. If you're not locked into the camera, you can drop out of the camera really easy by navigating, boop, you're outside. And if you now press spacebar H, you see now where the camera is. If the icon is too big or too small, there's an icon scale inside of the camera, which you can adjust. Sometimes people find it distracting. And if you want to use later depth of field in Mantra, for example, then you can take this blue line here and move this widget part here to the cup because this point here is the focal point later if you use depth of field. Yeah, this is the focal point here. Okay, done. Now, next step, after we have now our camera is we need a light. And what I want to do, because this is not a full rendering tutorial, it's only the last step of this modeling exercise, is I want to use an environment light, a light dome. And for Houdini, for Mantra, it's environment light. So control click here to get an environment light. And this environment light here is a dome which is around the scene. This widget here helps you to place later for sky, the sun, and so on. But what we need is only an HDRI. Let's switch over, name it dome. And then we'll switch over to the environment light here into the tab light here, environment map. And here I can load now from my job, from a project under text, I've placed myself here in HDRI. So you'll find enough HDRIs on HDRI Haven or free ones. So this here is one which I have forever and I don't know where I had it. Yeah, so I use this bridge HDRI, place it. And if you now want to rotate this because the lighting is not right for you and important you look here through the camera i like the positioning but if you want to rotate that you can use this widget here or you can go here to transform and this is the y which you then can with the value ladder now use to rotate around until you see exactly what you're after but i think that's good let's go out here drop out save and now we can make our first test render so if you go here to the render nodes, you will see if you ever made a test render here with this in viewport render, render region, or here in the render view, you have a mantra IPR. This is always generated in the moment you press render. So you get an IPR. Let's do that. I click here render and I press the H key over this viewport so that it scales the viewport so that I see everything. Mantra is a cool renderer, but it's a little bit slow in generating files. Waiting for the first pixel is sometimes a little bit annoying. In production, I mostly use V-Ray, but also RenderMan is really cool and there's a non-commercial version. And if you are more interested in rendering outside of Mantra, please let me know. I'm not the GPU guy, I'm more the CPU guy. So V-Ray, RenderMan, these are the two renderers which I really use for my visual effects work but I can tell you a little bit about these renderers if you're interested. Now you see how it looks and I think the lighting is okay for now. If you want to have this here finer, you see these edges here, you remember that if you use Mantra, you have to go here back to your cup, select this, go into the render tab and here, this here is only displaying at subdivision surface. So if you have the plus sign pressed and you see the container here in the viewport nicely here as subdivision surface, it doesn't mean that it renders like that. I shift minus again to get rid of this. This is only display as if you render with Mantra, you have to tick your render polygons as subdivisions in Mantra. And then you have here some options which you can read in the help file. I save and render the whole thing again and then you hopefully see that these edges here are nicely removed. Now you see it's nice and tidy. That's exactly what I am after. Now we can talk about the materials. So let's dive into the cup. And in our preparation, we've made our own material network here, Mantra Materials, and here was the assignment. I talked a little bit about why I do it inside of a container. I like this encapsulation of everything because I later want to make HDAs out of that and yeah, versioning then and so on. 
I dive here into my material network and here are our dummy materials which we used for the export to our 3D painting application and that's exactly now the thing we want to work with. I've talked about the principal shader a lot in my Houdini Fundamentals publication on Vimeo. So if you're interested really to dive deep into Houdini, learn in 18 and a half hours the basics of Houdini, please take a look in my publication. I think the concept is really, really useful for everyone who starts or switches to Houdini. But also in the free Houdini practice hours, I talked in the toothbrush project and the banana project a little bit about the principal shader. So I don't explain everything here in this tutorial, only the most important ones. And I start here with the couplet, so this area here. And the first important step here is always make sure if you're on the surface that you don't use the point colors. So deactivate that. Because we used point colors in the modeling process to see the different parts. And if you tick this, these colors will overwrite your base color. I pressed render again to show you that because in the modeling process I had this thing black and now you see we have gray here as a base color but in the moment it starts rendering it's black now. Keep that in mind. Deactivate the point color if you don't need that. Another thing I do here really fast is you see that you can have this renderer running but one tip is hold down the shift key and drag here an area which you want to render. So Mantra now only renders this area. It's much, much faster. And if you have the feeling that Mantra has a hiccup, that it hasn't changed something, stop it here with the red sign and render it again. Sometimes it happens. Get used to that. Okay, now we go here to the couplet again. Point color is gone. Then the next step is that we have to add textures. And there are two ways of adding textures to the whole thing. One way is to use here the tabs, textures, bump map displacement. But you also can add textures here through these inputs. For these, we have nodes. Yeah, for example, we have a texture node here, which you can add and you can connect these. And inside of the texture node, you load something. And every texture node has a UV input and so on. So Mantra is able to have really complex shader networks. You can stack shaders on each other and so on. And if you are interested in that, please let me know in the comments and I will make tutorials for that or take a look into my publication. But in this tutorial, we use the fast way so we can close this area here and we use the built in slots. We start here with the bump map. So I click here enable. Make sure that we use normals and now I can go into the texture path here. I click here and I load now my texture maps which I generated in the Substance Painter. Like I've said, in the bonus lesson you see how it works or you get these files on the Gumroad project. But you can do them by yourself, no problem. If you dive now into that, you see a whole bunch of textures. Like I've said, it's a classic workflow. So every of our materials has its own texture set here. And if you look into the name, you see here, for example, Cuplit, and these maps, one, two, three, four, five, six, are the lid. So you only have to search here for lid normals. If you don't see here the thumbnails, use your right mouse button, you can show and hide here these thumbnails. And sometimes if you have numbers in it, deactivate here, show sequences. Sometimes this makes problems, but this works fine here. Okay, let's take the couplet normals. I load them. Every time you change something, Mantra should start again and you see it works. There was nothing in the normals, so it only is a little bit nicer here. Nice. Let's go to the textures. And now I do the base color. Let's take a look here. I activate use texture here. And then I go here to this white arrow. I go to the lid, say I want to load the base color. You see this is this greenish blue. I load this. And now take a look here. It looks a little bit green bluish, but really dark. The question is, is it the right color? You haven't seen my project yet. It's in the bonus lesson. You will see it there. I think it's brighter. What happened? Two things can happen. One thing is the source color space is not right. But here's automatic and Mantra is really good to see, okay, this has to be sRGB, it's okay, and all the other maps which are not color, which are data, are linear. So maybe this is not a problem. 
But if you go back to the surface, you see one important thing. The base color here is grayish. And everything you do here with the textures are multiplied by the slots here. That means you have a texture and you multiply the color values of this texture with this grayish color. And if you multiply something which is not one, it changes. So if you want to have exactly the same value, you have to multiply it by one. And that's the thing we do here. We set the base color to one. And now you see that you get this here as a result. Yeah, stop it and render it or start it again. And now you see exactly the color I'm after. So these are multipliers for that. That's an important lesson. Let's go to the next one, roughness. I want to have the roughness map. I activate this. I go into the lit roughness, which is here. It's gray, right? I do that. If you have ever seen the original image, now you have to believe me, this is not the right roughness. Reason? Again, the roughness here is 0 0.3. And so your original roughness here, which you've painted, is multiplied by 0 0.3, so it's less. Yeah, you see, if I bring this to zero, this here changes. And that's the problem. So if you want to use these textures, you have to make sure that the multiplier is one. This is important for roughness. This is important here for the base color and also for metallic. So make it one here. Otherwise, your metallic map will not work correctly. Okay, let's make it faster. I go back here. I take now the metallic and I read the metallic, it's black, so it's okay. But if you have a metal and it doesn't come through, metallic has to be one. And now you see, wow, now it is really metallic. So let's stop this. Look here, metallic is one, texture is loaded. So hiccup, click here and ask him again to generate the scene. Yeah, and now you see everything is correct. So the first thing I always do is, and I demonstrate this now here for the outside paper, is I go through every of these shaders. I go to the base color and make it 111. Deactivate the point color because I don't want to have it. Roughness to 1 and metallic to 1 because I know that I now use textures for that. Okay, let's shift drag here another region so that we see here the paper and do it one more time. I go here to the bumper normals and enable that. I read in and this is now paper outside. So we have to go down and find here paper outside normals. There they are. We read this in, then we go to the textures. We first try metallic. So paper outside metallic, it's black, so it's multiplied by one, but it's black here, so zero times one is still zero. And then we have the roughness. Paper outside roughness, there it is. And we have here one, it's correct. And like I've said, sometimes it's really important that you start the render again so that it generates a scene new. And now we go to the base color. That's the most important thing for the outside base color. Here it is, here's the logo, it's brownish. And now hopefully everything is right started. Yeah, now you see, that's the result here of our work. If you want to get rid of this area here, shift and click outside here of this frame and then everything is back here for the full renderer. And now I normally walk through all of these here and do the same thing. I don't think that you need to see that. It's a little bit boring and I think it's clear <laughs> at this point. So let's finish the whole thing by setting up our final render. So I go back here into the scene view and I go into my camera. I lock myself into the camera and also take here my handle tool again because I want to rotate a little bit more into this direction. Yeah, something like that here. 
unlock the camera then we can go back to the render view and make a fast test again so that we see the nice logo which Karen has provided us for this tutorial yeah nice and colorful I like it yeah and then we now can go here to the render nodes or here it's the same if you go here to out here's only a mantra IPR this is our interactive renderer now we need a real mantra node so type in mantra the next thing I now do is a little bit yeah from my production experience I like a lot to work with variables so what I do is I name this node here for example cap underscore version one and then I go into this and here in the mantra node I only want to render the current frame I don't override my camera resolution because we have set the right camera resolution I make sure that this camera here exists so it's here on the camera then I go to the image which is stored out and you see this path with all the variables and what I want to do is I normally change this here there's a variable with the name $OS which stands for operator string so that's the name of this node and you see there I named it cap underscore zero one I don't need the hip name so what I do normally is I remove that and write $OS again so I make in the render folder a subfolder with this name cup underscore zero one and then I name my render cup version zero one then if you have animations this year dollar f means the frame number and four means in four digits if you have a still you don't need that at all so you can remove that and then you have exr as the file format if you want to see how this here now is used you can use your middle mouse button to replace here all the variables with the real stuff and then you see here the whole path let's go to the end and then you see in the render folder here I have a new folder cup version 1 and here is then the file the reason why I use that is if you ever want to test something or you have a new version I don't delete this node I hold down my alt key and make a copy of this node and in the moment I do that you see now the version is one up and I don't have to change this here so I get a new folder with a new version but I don't lose the old one that's a really important part if you are developing and you are afraid that you overwrite something which is important that's the idea behind this variable here okay so now let's finish this really fast I go to the image the file is saved here then you can decide if you need passes or image planes so this is not a rendering tutorial so we don't use anything of this here we go to rendering this is the render itself we want to use a PBR rendering so we go to physical based rendering so this is PBR if you want to use depth of field and you have your focal point and the aperture and so right you can activate it here but yeah not in this tutorial or at this point then we have here the anti-aliasing the pixel sampling it's three by three and then we have a noise level of one percent here which mantra tries to reach it reads the noise level and stops there or you are at the max samples these are the standard settings here that's it for this year what I do now is I save again only to make sure if you want to test your settings you can switch here the IPR window here to cup 01 then you exactly see what's going on and what you get and if you now want to render it directly to disk you can do it here or you can render it to disk in background and if you only want to have it in mplay so that you can see it on a separate monitor or whatever you can do it here I press now render here instead of saving it so to close now this tutorial at the end of this first module we have modeled everything together I hope I took the time to show you how procedural modeling can be done it was not complete I didn't use VEX and in real production there are more approaches which use programming
So I try to don't show anything with that. I showed you a little bit of age script and channel referencing only to get you in the mindset here. So it's not perfect, but I hope it helped you to understand. And we have now finished here this cap. In the next module, I want to do something with the coffee beans around that. So I'm concepting this at the moment. But I think this module is really good for starters. If you have any question about this module or techniques I showed here or wishes, please use the comments. You can write me an email on info at pixeltrain.net or de. If you want to support me, you can buy on Gumroad for a really small fee the project files or I have a Patreon where you can spend a dollar a month or five dollars a month or you can subscribe, give me a thumbs up. So please spread the word, be in contact. I have fun to work with you. If you ever think about a real remote training or onset training, please ask me. My name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. Have fun and see you next time.